Hello, everybody. My name is Suzette Martinez Standring, and I'm the host of It's All Right with Suzette, a half hour program on the craft of writing. And today, our topic is going to be about personal grief and the lessons learned from the 9 11 terrorist attacks. Today's author, Bill Timaeus, will help us to understand and overcome the type of conviction that proves deadly. For 36 years, Bill Timaeus was a columnist for the Kansas City Star and part of the reporting team that won the Pulitzer Prize in 1982. Since 2004, he has written his blog, Faith Matters, and columns for the Presbyterian Outlook, the National Catholic Reporter, and other publications on the subject of religion. He has received many awards from, for example, the National Society of Newspaper Columnists, the American Academy of Religion, and the 2005 Wilbur Award given annually to the best religion column in the country. He is the author of six books. And what you need to know today is that 20 years ago, Bill Timaeus lost his beloved nephew, Carlton Fife, during the 9-11 attacks. And navigating through grief formed the basis for his searingly personal insights about religion, based terrorism. And that new book is coming out in January 2021. It's called Love, Loss, and Endurance, a 9-11 story of resilience and hope in an age of anxiety. Welcome, Bill Timaeus from Kansas City, Missouri. Thank you, Suzette. Lovely to be here with you. Wonderful to be with you too, Bill. I read your book, so insightful, so well-written, really deep with lots of ideas and thoughts about our own feelings of certitude that often lead us in destructive ways and in so and in the 9-11 um, situation extremist destruction so first tell us about your nephew carlton fife and how his tragic book shaped this book how his tragic death shaped this book 20 years in the making yeah. Well, Carlton was a fabulous young man. He was actually born in Texas when his parents, my sister and her husband, were uh, living in San Antonio, but they fairly quickly moved to uh, North Carolina, where my sister was a nurse at Duke Medical Center, and Carlton's father was a biochemical researcher at Research Triangle Park there. Uh, so he grew up in North Carolina and went to, went to college at the University of North Carolina. But uh, when he graduated, he took a job in the Boston area with um, uh, Fidelity Investments and uh, also was doing additional school. Um, at the time of 9-11, he was married. Uh, he had an 18-month-old, 19-month-old uh, little boy, Jackson. Um, he had just gone to work. He had left uh, Fidelity and had gone to work for John Hancock in Boston. And uh, Carlton was uh, not my biological son, but I often thought of him that way. We were very close. Uh, he was uh, this strange mixture of uh, brilliance and funniness and uh, all of the above. His, his um, d dual major in college was philosophy and economics. Now, what do you, what do, you do with that? Uh, well, you look at the world in, in certain strange ways and wonderful ways. So uh, Carlton was uh, on 9-11, uh, had been given the opportunity to fly out to L.A. to attend a business meeting that he didn't much care about. But his boss said, go ahead, Carlton. Uh, you have good friends in Los Angeles. Drop in on this business meeting, but they'll give you a chance to get away and see some friends. So he said, oh, okay and off he went and that's the end um so i was in the midst that morning of writing our lead commentary for the kansas city star for an extra edition that we did that day uh, and i was about two-thirds of the way through the piece when i got the news that carlton may well have been on the first plane you know bill it's I think that 20 years later, it's so important to address the long-term consequences of grief through extremist destruction. And your book talks about 
using bad theology to further evil, and at the same time, how the power of true faith and interfaith action can overcome faith, uh, can overcome hate. So can you talk a little bit about that, about using bad theology to further hate? Yeah, the, the hijackers had been uh, schooled in uh, a very warped version of Islam. Islam is an ancient and, and generative uh, faith tradition that at its best has contributed a lot to the world. Uh, but uh, Osama bin Laden and some others had radicalized it in, in vicious ways and had taught the hijackers that uh, they needed to kill people to make the point about uh, whatever point they were trying to make. And of course, that point is always lost in, in the midst of, of destruction like this. Um, and what's, what struck me is that the hijackers uh, were certainly not alone and, and not the only people to fall victim to radical bad theology. Uh, history is full of examples of it. Uh, just in our in our own lifetimes, uh, at least my lifetime, we have the Holocaust. Uh, we we have uh, in the last few years we have the uh, shootings in in uh, Charleston, the Mother Emanuel Church. We have um, uh, shootings in the Pittsburgh synagogue and in El Paso, and on and on and on. And what we find is that people have adopted a kind of, of monochromatic thinking that, uh, it, that encourages or invites in no other thought. Uh, it, it's straight line thinking, it's rigid thinking, and there's only one way. They have all of the answers before they even hear the questions. And uh, one of the things that faith traditions like mine, I'm a Presbyterian, uh, has to do what faith traditions have to do is is create room for doubt, create room for uh, discussions that can challenge religion, to ask the hard questions, and perhaps the hardest question that religion deals with is why, if God is good and loving and all powerful, is there evil and suffering in the world? Uh, that's called the old theodicy question. And if you're not able to struggle with that within your faith community and ask questions like that, then you get led down this narrow path that can lead to just where the hijackers en ended up. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you, you know, we do live in a world that seems to hold religious certitude up as a strength and doubt is portrayed as disloyalty, a weakness. Mm -hmm. And you do point out exactly the opposite. Doubt is healthy. But, you know, even, even if you take away, if you move away from extremist mindsets, that still seems to permeate the, you know, uh, that doubt is a weakness. How can we help people understand that, um, that debate, that, excuse me, that debate, that questioning is a healthy thing? Well, I think the first thing that people need to remember is that we are finite minds trying to grasp the infinite. And the reality is that it is arrogant to say anything about God, anything. And yet, what other topic really is there? Uh, we, we are driven to try to understand the meaning of our own lives, uh, the, the, the power behind life. And so it is natural for us to want to know these things. Um, this, this new book, in some ways, is a follow-up to my previous book that's called The Value of Doubt. And in that book, I argue that if you're not part of a faith community where you can ask these difficult questions, you're never going to end up with a faith that can, can sustain you in good and bad times. And, and in the new book, I, I take a, a step further and look at uh, some of the ways in which this uh, narrow-minded thinking uh, leads to, to violence. Um, 
in addition to telling the story of how 9-11 caused trauma after trauma after trauma in my own family, uh, I break up the chapters with brief interludes in which I point to examples of this kind of rigid thinking and, and the, the, the evil that it has led to. Uh, so as we, as we move through life, uh, one, of, one of the things that I'm reminded of, there's a theologian named Shirley Guthrie, a male named Shirley Guthrie, who says, we are all theologians, whether we want to be or not, uh, and our job is to be modest theologians, not to assume that we have all of the answers. Uh, a rabbi once told me that the Talmud is 3,000 pages of unresolved debate. And uh, if that's the case, the lesson is don't ever think that you have the final word, the final answer on all of these questions, but you have to be open. You know, we have a few minutes before the break, and I want you also to address the other side of the spectrum, how true faith, inner faith act action has gone a long way toward uniting us and bringing us together and healing these terrible, these terrible events. Yeah, uh, even in my own, my own church as an example, uh, uh, the Second Presbyterian Church in Kansas City started at the end of the Civil War as a breakaway anti-slavery church from a pro-slavery church, recognizing that uh, in the border states and in the South, scripture had been used to justify slavery. And the 10 folks who started Second Church said to themselves, uh, something wrong with that. Let's, let's look at that. And so... Today, uh, my congregation has begun a new effort uh, to be anti, intentionally anti-racist and to teach us uh, the, the ways in which the systems around us crush people and what we can do about that. So that's, that's what faith communities ought to be doing. They ought to be lifting people up. They ought to be liberating people. Uh, if, if nobody reads my book, they should read John Meacham's new book on uh, John Lewis called His Truth is Marching On. Lewis was an example of someone whose deep faith informed how he lived his life, and he lived his life doing his best to liberate people. That is so encouraging, Bill. And we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to get, take a deeper dive into these questions of false and dangerous belief systems. Stay tuned for Bill Timaeus in our second half. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and we're back with author Bill Tobias, the author of Love, Loss, and Endurance, a 9-11 story of resilience and hope in an age of anxiety. Bill, I'd like to start this segment by reading a, a brief paragraph of, um, of a passage that appeared in your book. And you said, it's bad theology if it leads people to imagine that they can and do know the mind of God in a complete and inarguable way. Worse, it's certitude rooted in our own arrogance. Bad theology is whatever leads us away from love and joy and humility. You know it's bogus theology if it leads you to want to injure or murder someone else. When we see such theology, the last thing we should do is embrace it. I find that that was such a, a pithy paragraph of what your book is all about. And I think that part of the solution is, as you say, to recognize hate-based doctrine that fuels dest destruction, such as the Great Replacement Theory and white genocide and the general cherry picking of scriptures to bolster these ideas. Can you tell us more about these specific types of lies and theories and the danger of groupthink? Yeah, a lot of it goes back to how you interpret 
Holy Writ, Scripture. Uh, those who are more literal in their interpretation uh, uh, wind up uh, with ideas that don't conform to reality. Uh, and they wind up with ideas that hurt people. Uh, just think, for example, of, oh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the people who used the Bible to justify slavery. Well, there are people who use the Bible and other sacred writings to justify uh, keeping women down as, as second-class citizens mm -hmm. and who uh, would uh, keep people in the LGBT community down. Um, the religions have struggled with that for a long time, and there are, there are ways to, to read scripture that uh, you can make it say almost anything you want to make it say. But if you're being uh, true to the understanding how it was written, its history, uh, all of that, uh, you have to be open to uh, interpretations that are liberating. Um, if if you read scripture in a way that leads you to want to hurt people, want to crush them, uh, there's just know there's something wrong with your interpretation. Um, it, it's not that, that there are no rules in scripture. There, it's not that there are not rules by which to live and people break those rules and we should call them on it. It is rather that uh, when you believe that um, God has given you exactly the right answer to how to how to read something and how to therefore act, uh, that that we get into trouble. Um, any, my, my own pastor says, uh, as a, as a Christian, we need uh, what he calls to read uh, the Bible with a Jesus hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a fancy word for interpretation, and read it as though uh, it, it would. Is this what Jesus would would say and think, and and uh, with with that approach, you avoid the kinds of interpretations that wind up hurting people. I wonder what your thoughts are as our country is so deeply divided about um, using the mind of God, constantly invoking God's name to um, to bolster political positions. There is, to me, there's such a clear hypocrisy involved in that sort of thing. And yet, it's almost as if though faith and belief and certitude are being used to weaponize morality um, or certain people's views of morality to get to a particular um, result or goal. How do we pull back from that in the National Dialogue Bill? Yeah, well, one of the things I do in this new book is at the end of it, I, prov I provide, uh, I think, eight or nine approaches to what, what we can do to, to counter that kind of thinking. And some of those are, are just so obvious. Uh, you know, the world religions teach us that we should uh, respect other individuals because they bear within them the image of God. Now, as a Christian, I am required to see Christ in everybody. And when I do that, the last thing I would want to do is to hurt that person, to, to uh, somehow uh, think of that person as less than human. Um, it, we hear the terms these days, a human garbage, subhuman. You know, th those are the kinds of, of terms that led the Nazis to do what they did to the Jews and to others. Uh, it's, it's that kind of thinking that, that we have to uh, unplug. And so uh, I offer some ideas for, for how, to, uh, how to think about these things in ways that are, that are liberating. And uh, I, I, I wish I had uh, more confidence and I wish I were more optimistic that we can do this in the right way, that, that we can live in the ways that I think we ought to live. But uh, I've read history, and history doesn't give me a lot of cause for optimism, frankly. And so I can, I can bow to history and say, well, let's just 
be animals and do whatever we want to do. But I don't think I'm called to do that. I think I'm called to try to live uh, in, in a generative, liberating way that that seeks to uh, love others. And so that's what I'm committed to doing. And I'd like to talk right now about your own personal navigation through grief, the kind of grief at losing Carlton that has seared into your family and has long lasting consequences and ripple effects. I think that people who have not lost people in disasters, such as terrorist attacks, bombings, shootings, and all of that, they, they carry with them a very unique type of grief. Um, hard to explain if you had not gone through it yourself. And what has been some of the greatest help or components for healing in your own life? How do you overcome resentment and bitterness? I know your faith plays a big part in that, but what about people who don't necessarily have a faith tradition? Um, well, first of all, we, we do have to acknowledge that uh, uh, grief that comes out of a 9-11 type of event is a little different. It comes around every year and mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not like, you know, if my son died, Barbara's son had died in a, in a car accident on February 22nd. Uh, she would grieve every February 22nd, but, but she wouldn't turn on the TV that day and see that car smash into a bridge uh, every, every five minutes as she does on 9-11 now. So we have to acknowledge that, that there is a, a difference there. Um, but I think one of the things that has helped me through uh, this grief, and uh, it continues, uh, the grief continues, is, is simply memory. Uh, remembering the wonderful times that we had with Carlton, remembering his wonderful sense of humor, uh, remembering his accomplishments, uh, re being grateful for the time that we had. Um, Barb and Jim, Carlton's parents, could have adopted the idea that we're just going to cry and suffer for the rest of our lives because we've lost our son. But what they have done is to say to themselves, we need to be grateful for the years that we were given. Uh, none of those years was promised to us when Carlton was born. In fact, Carlton went through a difficult birth. Um, he, he was so anxious to be born that Barb was bedridden for six or seven months before he was born. And so they understand that, that no time is promised to us. And so they're, they're, they, they are grateful and, and I am grateful. I think back to the wonderful times I spent with Carlton, the fun we had, and it's that memory that I think um, anybody, whether a person of faith or not, can go back to and rely on. And it's that sense of gratitude that I think heals us in some ways. Thank you. Thank you for that, Bill. I'd like to ask you a little bit about the process of writing. This book, Love, Loss, and Endurance, is a bringing together of his history, personal um, emotions, religious insights, spiritual insights. How long did it take you to write this book? And it seems like it's so rife with so many um, emotional flashpoints. How did you get through the writing and what did you do to keep on going? Um, it's a good question, Suzette. I, I really felt a sense of obligation uh, about this book. Um, I, the day of 9-11, I had to decide once I learned about Carlton being on one of the planes, whether to put that in the column I was writing. And I felt I, I had to, uh, uh, as a columnist, part of my task is to give myself away, uh, to be vulnerable with people, to help them uh, wrestle with these questions. And so um, I, I've saved a lot of family emails and notes and, and over the years I've written blogs and columns and so on, so on about all of this, uh, all of in the 
desk drawers behind me. I have all those files of stuff. And I simply, uh, at first chronologically, went, went through them and tried to, to shape um, how this event had slammed into our family and continues to do so. Uh, one of Carlton's sisters is angry that I wrote the book. Uh, her, her, uh, his widow and other sister and parents are glad I wrote the book. So that, you know, it's that kind of family dynamics that we're dealing with. But the, the writing process, uh, uh, I, I just had to say to myself, Bill, you are a professional. Uh, you have to do this job. And that's how I finished that first column. Uh, I, my temptation was to just break down and walk out of the building, and I knew I couldn't do that. So I just had to remember that I'm a professional writer, and, and this is my job, and there is a, a story that needs to be told. And as one of the few journalists who, who was affected directly by 9-11 with a family loss, uh, that drove me to tell this story. I know of only one other journalist, and that person was also at the Kansas City Star at the time. He lost a cousin in the Pentagon that day. So I felt driven to, to do this. Well, thank you, Bill. That's putting your purpose to great use for all of us. And in the minute that we have left, please tell us how we can buy your book in January. Can we pre-order it? And yes. also how we can read your blog and get in touch with you. Uh, my book is available already for pre-order on Amazon, on, uh, on uh, Barnes & Noble. Um, uh, just uh, Google my last name and uh, my blog will pop up. It's called Faith Matters. Uh, and from the blog, you can get to uh, my other books and my other writing, and you can find a link to, to the new book. And for viewers, Bill Timaeus' last name is spelled T-A-M-M-E-U-S. Bill, thank you for being with us today. It was a very insightful and fabulous read. So intelligent, so easy to understand. Really hits, hit me in the heart with a lot of resonance and hope and encouragement. Thank you and, very much, Suzette. And we'll see you all the next time on It's All Right with Suzette. Stay safe, everybody.